It's time we talked about the wounds of trauma in your childhood and under earning. And that's when you could be earning sufficient and fair money that supports you. But for reasons that maybe you can't see clearly yet, you're not. It's very common for people who grew up neglected and abused to under earn. And I want us to talk about this because the longer you're under earning, the further out of reach is your freedom to undo old trauma driven choices that you made about relationships and work and where you'd live and to finally build the happy and materially secure life that you need. Now, I don't know why, but trauma experts hardly ever talk about this. Like, I don't know, you're not supposed to talk about money. It's not irrelevant, right? <laughs> it's a huge factor in how we got traumatized and it's a huge factor in how we're gonna heal from trauma. So there's this idea that, um, you know, concerning yourself with money is too consumerist, it's too trivial, it's too materialist, it's too capitalist. But actually those arguments are often why under earners don't earn enough money to just take care of their basic needs, all right? That is not greedy. You're saying that it's the system's fault and fair enough, most systems are, have problems and they're complicated and there's unfairness built into them. But with under earning, you're not doing what you can do to work within the system where you are and you're in this system, right? This is where you are. So if you're not charging enough or if you're in a line of work that pays notoriously little or you're not putting in the time or the learning or the relationship aspect of work to actually make it go where you need it to go, then there's an inside barrier going on. And if you can get the courage to look at what's going on with you inside, it's actually really wonderful because this is the thing that you can actually change. So let's talk about under earning. What are the signs and what can you do about it? All right, the first sign is that you live in vagueness. <laughs> you feel or you know that you're not living the full and happy life that you could be, not just in terms of money, but also relationships and health and the kind of work that you choose, but you're never quite sure how much you need or what you actually want is or what sort of the budget is or how you're gonna get there. How will you make this work? So you'll stay in a fog of hoping and sometimes being in pain, but not actually having a clear vision of where you're trying to go and charting out the steps you'd have to take. Like a lot of things, that's how you do it. The action you need to take when you're vague never comes into focus. The second sign is that although you might be scraping by, you're going into debt and you have no practical plan to change that and to start building up savings instead of piling up money that you owe. And I'm sure you've been told that you have to live within your means and maybe you overspend, it's easy to do. But if you're not earning, you know, bottom line enough to live on, then you're under earning. And no matter how much you change, the, how much you're spending, if you're not fulfilling what you could be doing there in a way that's wholesome, real, validating for you, honest, then you're still in under earning. All right, the third sign, is you're resentful about the fact that you don't earn enough. You're not necessarily resentful at yourself maybe, but you're resentful at things outside of yourself, your family, your gender, your country, the economic system. And I've been to countries where the system really is stacked against people, but even there, people with a healthy sense of self-care work in that system to make sure their needs are met. And I know some people have illnesses and disabilities that might make self-care impossible. That is an under earning. Although there are situations where physical health problems can be part of under earning, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But sane earning, healthy earning, means you evaluate the limitations out there and the limitations in here, and you find what is going to get your needs met. So another kind of resentment this is the fourth sign, is that you've decided to make your career a line of work that is well known not to pay well. And instead of doing what it would take to get paid well, being some kind of star in that field, like let's say a novelist, um, you know, <laughs> getting a second job or a new line of work would be a way that you could start making more money. Or you could stay there believing that the world should do this thing, but your anger isn't making it happen. So one way or another, either you're gonna go in and lobby that novelists get paid, 
you know, which could take the rest of your life and still not yield any results. Or you could find a way to meet your financial needs as even as you work on your writing on the side. It's just how it goes. Now, maybe you're right. There are societies that pay their artists, but if you're not in one of those societies, you need a plan B that is in your society or you're going to be under earning. The fifth sign of um, that you're under earning is that you're in a line of work where you ex you expected to earn increasingly more money as time went by, but that's not happening for you. And there's a, there's a few big reasons why that might be. Maybe you're in an organization that doesn't need or want to pay someone at that level, um, or you don't have the skills to raise your pay, or you haven't asked for a raise. Now, sometimes getting a raise means you have to change jobs or move laterally, but generally speaking, if you don't ask for a raise or declare higher rates for your time, nobody's gonna come and give it to you. We can kind of lose that point when we come from a traumatized family, you know, a dysfunctional family, and then go into a work situation with a boss and coworkers and kind of project onto them like they're our family, parentify the boss or the team, and instead of like shepherding our own career and deciding when it's time for a raise and when it's time to move on, if you can't get it there, you get mad at the other people for not taking care of it for you. But just look at reality, you know, in most situations, it's, it's something that you're gonna have to drive for yourself. There's no parent there. There's no mom or dad who goes in and goes, you know, organization, it's really time that you gave Anna a raise. It just rarely happens. So if it does, great. But if it doesn't, it's just time to be the person who advocates for yourself. Some jobs have that kind of thing, a structure of reward, you know, they really pay attention. But I'll tell you, I've never had a job like that. And I wasted a lot of years just being mad that I wasn't being recognized as worthy or paid what I was worth. I was mad, but I didn't act for a long time. And then I did, and the problem was solved. The sixth sign, is blaming other people for the fact that you are stuck. And this is often what under earners do. They outsource responsibility for growth in their career and their life to other people. So this is similar to you know, resenting people for what, how much money you have or the fact that you don't have, they have money and you don't. But this is about like resenting people because you believe that they, um, they have to allow you to grow. They haven't created conditions where you can. And I'm just telling you in the age of the internet, it's almost impossible not to grow if you avail yourself of the knowledge that's out there. And some of you have heard the story. When I lost my consulting work in 2008, a lot of people were losing their jobs. I started a video production company. It was something I sort of knew how to do. And I had to cold call people and come up with something. It was necessary. I had kids. I was a single mom. I had to do something. And it was interesting. I don't think I would have done anything so daring if I hadn't lost this other work that I had. But the work that I ended up doing was so much more interesting, you know, than what I was doing before and so much more suited to me and it paid better. But I only took the chance and went for it and tried. Well, you know how I learned to do it? <laughs> on Google. I just Googled how to do this stuff. You know, how do you send an email? How do you make a cold call? How do you do digital editing? I had a little knowledge about editing from old days before it was digital, but I had to learn it all over again. And then I hired somebody to help me. And then I hired somebody who totally made a disaster of the job and I lost that client. And then I hired somebody better. And all of these experiences is how I learned how to do this. They're you know, I, they're, they're just, <laughs> I, I've always hoped, like, isn't there somebody who can come just tell me how to run crappy childhood fairy? Like, I feel like we're missing a lot of opportunities and I can't think of everything all the time. And no matter how much the team and I are working, like, I think, I think a whole bunch of possibilities are kind of slipping away from us. That's like a feeling I have. But when I think that what I need to do something about that is for some magical, you know, wise person to come and tell me, I see what that is, Anna. It's like, I mean, it is, it's a fantasy. I imagine it sometimes, you know, what would this business leader say to me? And it's usually like, back to work. <laughs> you, got, you, got, you got to do the things right in front of you. So I've read books. Um, I have some favorite business books I've read that really helped me realize that as long as I was in the trenches trying to do everything myself, nothing could grow and I needed to start bringing on team members. And so it's really cool. Now there's like 10 people who work with me on Crappy Childhood Fairy. So it's more time for me to be making videos and writing a book. And when I do a good job at that, the whole company you know, 
can grow. It can support all these families that it does. And so I feel really good about that. I feel really good about that. And we, we provide a lot of services for free. And that's something I want to talk about too, because doing things for free or volunteering things is a way that we under earn sometimes, but there's a conscious way to do it. I'll tell you about it in a minute. All right. You don't want to be resentful. Resentment feels bad, even if it's on the surface. Um, you want to be friendly and positive. But when there's resentment under that, people can feel it. If you're like just about everybody, your success in earning money depends a lot on creating a positive experience or um, a good uh, a good product for people so that when they engage with the thing they pay you for, they're like, oh, this is good. I think I want more of it. I think I'll tell my friends, right? That's how, that's how we succeed in making money. And if you have a boss, you make your boss successful. I mean, all of this was lost on me. I wasn't raised to understand that. I kind of had a head full of hippie ideas of like, the boss is the man and, you know, I should just get away with everything I can. I, <laughs> when I was 16, I tried to get a job at McDonald's and they wouldn't hire me. And I look back now and I'm like, I, I literally don't know why, but I, I must have said something. I think um, I didn't understand what they were really looking for that like McDonald's, their job, they're just trying to like cook some food really fast and have people work as a team and not be too opinionated about better ways of doing it because it's been handed down from on high and you know, you kind of fit in and, and you do that really fast. And I can admit, knowing me, I probably went in there and just said, you know, a bunch of opinions about it. And that is what I now get paid for, right? Is giving you opinions about stuff. Like I created a job for myself where I could be like that, but McDonald's wasn't it, wasn't it. And um, one of these days, I don't know, one of these days, I just want to go to McDonald's and I just want to work there for a couple of hours. That's totally impractical. Just to prove that I could do it, just to show them like, I'd, I'd be really good at this job. <laughs> I remember it like really hurt my confidence when I didn't get that job. I really needed money when I was 16. My family didn't have money. We were poor. We didn't have like a washing machine for clothes. We didn't have hot water for two years. And there wasn't money for clothes or makeup or lunch. I could have like free lunch at school, but I was embarrassed about it. So I always wanted some money to like buy the junk food everybody else ate, which I realize is kind of sad, but, but that's what I wanted to do. And so I always had to work. And I wasn't really good at getting hired in conventional jobs. I never really have been. I've had a few, didn't really go anywhere with it. Where I've been able to do really well is where I'm working for myself. That's who I am. That might be who you are. I think it's not uncommon for people with complex PTSD. When you can set your own hours, when you can have sort of temporary relationships with clients. And so if things, you know, start to not feel good, it's not right, you can stop having that client and you can move on to another one. But it works really well for me and it's very motivating to know that if I work really hard, if I um, you know, try to find how I can add some value for, for my clients or my customers, which is a lot of you actually who buy my courses, if I work on that, that's how I succeed. My success doesn't depend anymore on kissing somebody's butt, you know, on fitting in well, of playing along, of not complaining. It's nothing like that. Like everything depends on me just doing a good job at bringing value to people who pay me for something. And that really works for me. It's clear, it's clean. So I'm just gonna put that out there. Number seven is, this is one of the ways that under earning, I, I just see this all the time and it's not charging enough for your time, right? In my work now and in the past, I've hired a lot of freelancers, probably like 600 of them. And if I'm interested in their work, um, of course, one of the first questions I'm gonna ask is, you know, what's your rate? What do you charge? And they might say $20 an hour, or they might say 40 euros. I work with people in Europe as well, or they might say $100 or $10,000 a month. You know, I've, I've worked with a lot of people and they tell me their rate. And generally, if I agree with their rate, that's what I pay. And from time to time, I, you know, say, I, I think you should get paid more than that. That's happened before. And from time to time, I just go, sorry, we don't have a budget for that. And they drop their price for me after I say that. But I'll tell you who I never hire. And there's a lot of them. And it's people who I say, what's your rate? And they'll say, oh, you know, $70 an hour. But I would drop it. I would come down to whatever you could pay. And what that does is that tells me like right then that they are not confident that they're worth $70 an hour. It's some outside idea to them. And I actually, you know, all I have to go on and all any employer has to go on is, you know, I don't know, what do you think you're worth? 
And then they can maybe test you out on the job, or if you came up through the ranks, they know something about you. This is why actually changing jobs and being in a new cast of characters can create an opportunity for you to come up on your earning because people didn't know you before. They don't just think of you as like the intern. I had that. I, had, I went to grad school in my early 30s and I did an internship. It was very low paid, but it was paid, but it was very low paid. And when I graduated, I said, I want a big raise. <laughs> they were like, well, no, you're an intern. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not, I have a master's degree now. And I had to lobby for that. And later in that job, I doubled that rate. I doubled the rate one day when uh, my, I was a single mom and my husband and I split up. Um, this was in my first marriage. And I was in a sudden crisis of having to find a way to have enough money to support the kids and keep the home that we lived in as a rented house. And, and a, a woman mentor at work helped me with this. And she said, you're not charging enough. And I said, but if I charge more, they're gonna fire me. And she said, I don't think they will. And anyway, I'll help you craft what to say if they absolutely refuse to budge on what they're paying you. But promise me, she said, that if they won't change what they pay you, you will go out and find work that will because you need this to survive. And so that's a really interesting way to set, to set your worth is first I had to think about, well, what do I need? And as a single mom, you know, that was like the, the dominant thing was I have to have enough to make ends meet. I just have to. And I've got to figure out a way to do that. But it turned out the work I was already doing was worth twice what I was charging. So when I asked <laughs> the boss who used to think of me as the intern a few years before, when I asked <laughs> and said, um, I need to double my rates. <laughs> and then what happened is I left and took another job for six months. And then I came back. They were like, oh, it's so great you're back. And I said, great, I'll, I will, I'll come back, but I need twice what you used to pay. And that's how I did it. And I remember like his face was just like, what? He, he was stricken and shocked. I've had people do this to me too. And you know, you come up with this decision, well, is it worth it? And you know, sometimes it's a mental adjustment, but yeah, it's worth it. So he agreed to pay it. And then I had all this like shame and guilt, right? That it's like, I'm charging too much. I'm not worth it. I'm just this schlubby mom. You know, I've always got like food running down my front and I just haven't had a haircut in two years. And so I got a haircut, I got glasses, <laughs> new glasses, you know, ones, those little rectangle ones back in the 2000s that everybody had. I got a nice haircut and um, I started dressing nicer. And I started showing up to work early and I started doing a really good job so that inside I felt very much worth that new pay rate. And soon everybody accepted it and soon other people in the organization, I worked for a long time as a contractor, um, like full time within an organization. I would work for different departments and so different departments could hire me. And I had more work than I could do after a while. And it was after I raised my rate. Keep in mind that sometimes when you're hiring somebody, uh, somebody is trying to hire somebody like you, if you're too lowball with the price you give or the wage you ask for, it communicates to them that you're low level. And so I, I never advocate like BSing people. I really think integrity and honesty is important. It's really important to match the quality of work that you deliver with the price you're charging. You need to be astute about that. Do some research, you know, talk to people, learn what the fair rate is. And then instead of using resentment or guilt or shame or anything like that, or stuffing it down, you don't use any of those negative things. You, you work on yourself to be worth a little more and you ask for that rate. And I'm so glad I did that. Cause the thing is like, when you ask for a raise, when you get a raise, even if it's a normal sized one, you know, say 10% would be a healthy raise, right? But if you get that 10% raise this year, instead of having it be forgotten until a year from now, your, your base pay just went to here. And then a year from now it goes here. If you hadn't gotten it, your base pay would be here. And next year, your raise would take you here. So every time you kind of keep your foot lightly to the gas of trying to get paid what you're worth, you are, you're not just helping yourself today, you're changing the whole trajectory of your earning potential. Now I'm getting to the stage of life where it's like very clear to me that it, retirement money is needed. And my life was always in such an emergency, like so many of yours I know that I was just like, that may be, I realize there's a future and I'm gonna need that, but I need every penny I've got right now to get by. And that was where I lived and it was really hard for me to get out of that cycle of always living in a financial emergency. And it came, I did, I did read a book about finance 
that was part of it. But also I got re-regulated. I got neurologically regulated so that all the little choices I made from day to day about, you know, where will I work or what will I spend or who will I date or will I date? <laughs> and can the kids use hand-me-downs or do I need to have new stuff? Like all those little decisions that I made, they add up to changing your status in life. And it's funny how they do that. You start doing the little things. I think it was Susie Orman had a book and she's like, you know, start going to the cheapest gas station, pick up pennies when you find them. And I was like, well, what difference does it make? But I don't know, there's something that changes when you do that. And so I became a penny picker upper and I would always tell the kids, oh look, good luck. <laughs> if I found a penny um, heads down, like tails up, I would flip it over and leave it for somebody else. You know, I just had this little ritual but I was tuning in. I was tuning into my intention and my goal to really get on my feet financially. And it wasn't easy. It took a while. <laughs> there were a lot of ups and downs, but it did go somewhere. And I would like to put in a plug that one of the worst things for your finances is to be in a doomed relationship. A doomed marriage, for example, will take you down and um, cost you an arm and a leg adjusting your housing afterwards, having children in a doomed marriage. That's what I did. I knew it was a doomed marriage, but I, you know, I'm really grateful I had the kids and I was in, you know, we were doing it. So that's, that's what was happening, but it just wiped me out. It wiped me out financially. And so my mom had raised me with this idea that she's like, oh, marriage is just a piece of paper and it's an old outdated institution and a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. And that was kind of a lot of mental clutter for me and moral clutter on like, well, what, do I, what am I really after here? I, I really did want kids. And so when I decided to um, go ahead and have a baby, even though the baby's father didn't want to be in my life at that time, eventually he he was and now he still is. but. But, uh, but I made that decision to go forward. I really had no idea what I was getting into. And I know a lot of you have been there too. And everybody was just like, cool, you know, very Murphy Brown or whatever. <laughs> it, was, it is really hard. It's really hard to straighten things out financially. And if I had not gone, you know, just full bore on creating a business and always making a decision, this is how much money I need to be okay. Like I live in California. So it's like, it's an economy all by itself. It's like Switzerland or something. You just, you have to make so much money here. And if I moved away, the kids wouldn't be near their dad. So I was always in this dilemma and there was just no choice. It's like, I'm just gonna have to earn more. And I did, and I did. So I'm making a very roundabout point as I like to do sometimes that I ended up solving this problem by getting online and teaching myself some skills. I, you know, I just, I had an idea of something I could sell for a high amount of money. I just, you know, the work I had been doing before, even if you go to the top of the hourly rate for consultants, I was in like nonprofit stuff and it was never going to be enough. It just was never going to be enough. And it was going to be a real goose chase to try to keep getting the next job. And so I needed to have something that paid better. <laughs> and I needed to change careers and that's what I did. I just scanned the horizon. This was one of my favorite games, by the way, that, you know, when we're hanging out with friends at my house, I, if somebody's like, I don't know what I should do. And I'm like, oh, oh, this is my favorite game. I would love to, you know, let's brainstorm what you could do to be, you know, okay, first of all, how much money do you need to be making? And they say this number that sounds impossible. I'm like, okay, here we go. I've got it. <laughs> and uh and there's a way there's a way and i know like not everybody has the 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 skills the education the um you know the connections to people the social grace uh, there's so many things that can get in the way i know i have a whole bunch of those myself i hate it when people judge me and they're like you have blonde hair obviously everything's fine it's like no i was feral i did not know how to get along with people I had no idea. I was completely like brainwashed as a kid that jobs are bad and they're always taking advantage of you. That's a big one. Okay. Let's talk about this sign there. This is a sign of under earning. And this is part of the resentment one is this belief that people that organizations who pay you always have a nefarious motive and some do, and you shouldn't work for them. You should do your homework and find out, is there a nefarious motive that I'm not okay with? and don't work there. But most things like if you work at a sandwich shop or, you know, you work at a department store or you work in a tech company, 
everybody is kind of like up to the same thing. They're, they're trying to like create value for people that brings in enough money that they can get ahead. Everybody's trying to do that. If you're an owner in something like that, you have to work a lot at the beginning and you have to, you know, shoulder a lot of responsibility and you get more money. I looked at that. So I was, I used to be resentful at owners and I'm like, but they get more money. How can I be one of those? So, you know, consider, consider flipping your script on that about, you know, that people who, people who are in a position to hire people who do make good money, like, could you possibly make friends with the idea that you are one of them one day? Could that be okay? Could that not have to compromise your moral integrity, your commitment to serve other people? I wanted to tell you about the free thing. So when you give away work for free, um, there's a time for it, like in an internship, but see what happened when I was an intern? I wasn't free, but it was, it was a pittance. It was hardly anything. By doing that, I changed their perception of me. So it was very hard for them. It was quite a fight to convince them I was a 34 year old woman with a very nice master's degree and should be paid accordingly for the work that I was doing. And um, they couldn't see it anymore. And so every time that you give free work to somebody, because you think that you can't get clients without it. A friend, a friend who just started a business, a, a coaching business, talked to me about this. She got her first client. They, in the, an hour before their first appointment, they go, oh, I don't have the money. I don't want to do it. And my friend contacted me. It's like, what should I do? I'm like, do not chase after that client. Don't chase after them. Don't do it. Eventually the client came back and was willing to pay. But it's a little bit like dating. When somebody breaks up with you, do not go chasing them and just go, that's fine, I'll crap fit to the whole thing. Because even if they say yes to it, and even if you get half the money or whatever, their impression of you, they've lost that those starry eyed thing where you are worth that to them, where they're gonna give you their best as a client, and you're gonna give them your best as whatever it is, you know, their, their doctor, their coach, their, their builder, whatever your line of work is, that when you are awake inside, and one way to be awake is with my daily practice technique, I, if I weren't giving value, if I started feeling like I'm ripping people off or something, I, I, it would disturb me, I wouldn't be able to sleep. And the daily practice sees to it that I stay in line and in integrity with myself. In case you're new to the channel, it's a specific writing technique followed by meditation to get free of fearful and resentful thoughts that really get in the way of making good choices for yourself, of seeing red flags when they're in front of you, of um, being able to express yourself honestly about things. So when you start clearing up all that self-suppression and codependence and, um, you know, just crap fit taking what you can get even though it's not enough when you don't have any fear about that anymore and I know it's hard it's like I just trust there's going to be money <laughs> and um but you have to because if you if you just keep compromising yourself you will you will stay on the path of compromise now I'm not like some woo-woo person like you know, <laughs> you create the whole reality. It's like, ah, eh, we're in the world. Sometimes it's really rough. I, I know a woman in Africa who raised her kids by growing tomatoes and selling them on a piece of fabric by the side of the road. She did the whole thing like that. It's not an easy road, but we rise to the occasion of the circumstances we're in to meet the needs that are right in front of us. And that's what sane earning is. It might be different for the woman who sells tomatoes than it is for the person who, you know, creates a cosmetic company. It's like two different paths, right? But it's the same thing where you're trying to meet your needs. You're trying to rise to the occasion and use the talents and the gifts that you have. So when you work for free, you sabotage that whole idea of yourself. You're not, do you're, you're, you're sacrificing doing your best. And I ask you if you've ever done this, because like when I had a video company, people would ask me all the time, will you do a pro bono video? And I would want to say yes, because I think, well, maybe we'll get more work. I never got more work from people we did free videos for. And the kind of videos we were making, these corporate videos, it was like five, 10, $15,000 worth of work. And I'd have to pay the team for it. So me doing free work was insane <laughs> for them. But here's the thing, they never, I can't remember any time I ever did a pro bono job or a deeply discounted one where people's appreciation was in proportion to the donation given. If I had written a check for ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 to that nonprofit, oh, you bet I'd be invited to the gala at the end of the year. There was no invitation. There was no thank you. 
they were actually kind of irritated because psychologically they felt like, well, if you're working for free, you, you must be desperate or, and then a little bit I was, I guess. It took me a long time to get a client base, but the jobs I did free did not, were not the ones that did it. And so I'm not saying that's a rule that may have worked for you. Likewise, when you take a job at low pay, well, sometimes you're just in a pinch and you have to take whatever job's available and it's not quite enough, but you have to take it, then you have to stay committed to keep looking and move on to the job that does meet your needs. And I know when you have trauma, it is so tempting to just like give up trying, to give up pushing yourself, to not do things outside your comfort zone because it's so triggering. It just there's gonna be a whole bunch of dysregulation and how are you gonna manage it? And if you get dysregulated, you might mess up. And I know, I know how hard it is, but that's what I say, you know, foot lightly to the gas pedal, always kind of pressing forward on this one. You know, I'm trying to get to my right relationship to work. I'm trying to get to my right relationship with money so that I have enough. And it's very important to well-being. Like, see if you can cleanse yourself and release a lot of your negative programming about money and people who have it. There's a lot of that in dysfunctional families. You know, the reason those people are normal is just because their mom had a trust fund and blah, blah, blah. Well, maybe. But also they're normal. <laughs> they're not, like, drunk all the time. <laughs> so, so my family had a lot of that. They had a lot of um, judgment about people who didn't have problems of the caliber we did. And you know, that's exactly what I did when I was in the problem phase of my life, but how I changed and got into the solution phase of my life is I started to become open-minded and open-hearted towards people who were doing okay and see if I could learn a little bit from them. You know, how did you do that? When you set a budget, how much do you allow for this and that? And then I learned, you know, I learned some stuff and um, I also saw some things that I would never be able to attain too. Like, I, <laughs> and that's okay. I know, like life isn't fair. And I know there's gonna be a chorus of that. Like how, Anna, how can you expect me to do my best when the world is so unfair? And it's like, I just, you know, you just kind of have to, right? I haven't succeeded in changing the conditions of the world. I don't, maybe a little bit. I do my part, right? I do my drop in the bucket. I want you to do your drop in the bucket. And for you to do that, you have to come, come up. You have to step up and start becoming who you are, doing your best and getting paid what you need. When you don't have enough money, you cannot bring your gifts to bear. You might be able to, I think a few people can, Mother Teresa, right? There's some people, what they are called to do, they can do under any conditions. But let's say, Mm, you're a musician, right? You're gonna need an instrument, right? When I had a video production company, I was gonna need the internet. I had to have a laptop. I remember I, I bought a laptop, like it had to be an Apple. I had to be like industry standard so people would take me seriously. And I had to get the software at the time, it was Final Cut. <laughs> I had to have this stuff and Final Cut was 800 bucks and the laptop was whatever, 2000 bucks and I didn't have it. I didn't have anything and I, I did it on a credit card and I was like shuttling money from one credit card to the other, to the other, to the other. But I hung in there and I didn't, I didn't stay content with just scraping by and I kept going. And later in 2014, when I got married, I was out of debt. That was my great accomplishment. I was out of debt. And for a lot of people, that is the dream, you know, to finally be out of debt. I've been in debt all my life and it felt really good. And then I was able to shift my focus onto the next hurdle, which is, could I start having some savings? And I'm happy to tell you, yes, I have some now. And my husband and I were, and I were able to buy a house, which we didn't have a house. You know, we've been renting a house all this time. We've been married 10 years. And um, we're just, we're super duper focused. We're super focused. And so when I really needed somebody to run the marketing here, you know, he stepped in. <laughs> we are being practical here. He's doing a great job, by the way. When you get emails and things from us, he's like, he's running all the automation and making sure that happens and bringing in the designer and the writer and all the people who do that. And we have this beautiful team that works together. And I think about this sometimes when I'm going to bed at night, I think about how grateful I am that the work we do together not only brings healing into the world and something positive into the internet, but it also supports all these families and couples and individuals who work here. And that's a really good thing to do. I feel good about that. So I just, you know, I wanna go in depth about like, I'm inviting you to change any animosity you have to people who have money and start opening up to all the reasons why that is a good thing. 
And I remember, so Brendan Burchard, he's one of the people who mentored me on how to do a business like this online. And um, he always says, no money, no mission. <laughs> no money, no mission. <laughs> And that's a really good thing to keep in mind. So um, you see that a lot with coaches, influencers, freelancers, and people who just have jobs feeling sad, angry, and repressed because they're not getting paid fairly for what they earn. So I'm just your other voice just going, come on, if, if they're not going to bring you there, you're going to bring you there, and we're going to help you. We're going to bring that encouragement. All right. <laughs> The price you set for your work, whether it's a wage or, or a, a rate, if you're, you know, if you work for yourself or a project price, it's a boundary. A price is a boundary. And if you can't get work at that price, you may need to bring it down later, but you need to express your boundary and showing people that you have a boundary at that communicates very powerfully to them that you do have worth. Even after you've made a proposal or given a rate or, you know, people will say, what's your desired salary? Even after you do that, when you've given that, do not bring it back down. Don't undercut yourself. Just say what the number is and do some research. So it's, it's reasonable, but good, right? Say what the number is. If they balk, if they want to negotiate, consider negotiating, but never ever just say, oh, well, it's $50,000. But I mean, I would drop it to you know anything at all that you would be willing to pay. Do not do that. That is how you communicate that you don't value your own work. And that's what they're going on. Are you good? It's, you know, it's scary hiring somebody and giving them your money. What if they're not good? So you go by that. You, you're kind of watching their energy when they communicate to you what their boundary is about money, what their boundary is about hours and time and um, advancement in those things. So there's no way around stepping up and beginning to own your career path here and being able to advocate for yourself about what's fair and right for you. If you don't set that boundary, you will never find out whether people would have honored it. So the minute you say, I don't know, 50,000 or 30,000, they go, okay, how about 30,000? You are oh, okay. <laughs> they would have said 50. So you have to give them a chance to tell you what, what they would have done. So that's a, just a little negotiating tip for you. Now, I know not all jobs are totally fluid like that. Like in my company, we have jobs, they pay X, that's what they pay, you know, and if people stayed for a long time and really grew in that, we would certainly be open to raising their pay. We pay very well, I think. But, but personally, I've always liked working for myself because there's a clear relationship between quality and quantity of work and money. And I personally, I find it hard to have somebody else have control over that. I feel like... Well, I don't know. I have, I've never been good at getting hired, promoted, or cast in things until I took matters into my own hands and was able to do things. All right, I want to talk about another sign of under-earning. And this one, I don't even think I can name it right, but it's like a block. Under-earners get a big block on growing. You know, everything that I'm saying, you know, would just be like, no, 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 no. These are all the reasons, no. And it's a compulsion to hold back their power to grow. So maybe if that's you, you're not updating your skills or you're resisting the technology that everyone else uses or, you know, and complaining about the technology like email is so, blah, 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 you know, well, or you're not dressing the part of someone who solves problems. I, I was hanging out with somebody who was meeting who, you know, we were at a party where a potential employer and my friend really wanted to get this high level job with them, but hadn't dressed the part. So I didn't say anything, but. You gotta dress the part, try to look like the person, you know, dress nicely. And I say that in my work, <laughs> in my work, I dress really comfortably. If you're, if you're like me, you know, it's, it, it, with complex PTSD, sometimes sensory stuff, it's just, it's too much to be wearing binding clothes or hot clothes or itchy clothes or anything. So I favor comfort. And I went through the pandemic like everybody. But when you're going to be around people who have the power to make a decision to hire you, look the part, dress cool, find clothes that look good on you. It doesn't matter what size you are. You can do this on a low budget. Put some effort into it. When people are looking to hire, they are looking for someone, in essence, to solve problems for them. So it's hard to keep that in mind sometimes. But when people have a job to fill, they... Um, you know, there's a problem and they're looking for somebody who will make that problem be not a problem anymore. And so that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to um, demonstrate like I can handle this problem. It's not going to be a problem for you. You can put your trust in me. You can stop worrying about it. So if you have that, 
if you have that quality, if you're able to kind of see what would solve the problem and communicate it in a nice way, and don't do it like I used to do of like, your whole team is totally stupid here. They have to do it this other way. I see how they should do it. I know. Have you done that? Yeah, you can't come off as arrogant. You have to be a team player. You have to honor what other people have done. You have to find a gentle and diplomatic way to come in and suggest a way to do it better. And that's how you can sort of prove that you're a problem solver. So if you can do that, um, then happily, there's a lot of growth that can happen just by stepping up a little. Those are the types of jobs that grow a lot. So this connects us to the eighth sign of under earning, and that's that your clothes and your things are cruddy. Now I said dress the part, but not only that, I'm talking about your furniture, um, your car, if it's if the door is held on with coat hangers. I know, I grew up poor. I know how these things get this way. But we have to begin, if you're going to start stepping up, you have to begin addressing them and sometimes you have to make something better before the money is totally here. Not on credit, I'm not one of those people. But you have to start doing your best, like keep the car clean, keep, the, keep your shoes clean. That's something I did when I was first trying to move up the ladder. I had a very low level admin job and I ended up with a higher level job. And one of the things I did every day was I cleaned my shoes and I wore like, this is in the days of pantyhose and high heels. And I had these like suede high heels and I had a suede brush and I would always make sure that they were clean and nice. And I was always put together and um, put a lot of effort into making sure my clothes were appropriate and looked like the management level. I just, you know, I read this in books. My family did not teach this to me. So there I was, I was like 27 years old and I read books about how you do this. And that's what it said. And I read etiquette books. I didn't know when you're supposed to talk and when you're not supposed to talk. I had a habit of shooting my mouth off in case you hadn't noticed. So furniture, um, just the emotional and spiritual reflection of your space. You've heard my thing about like, you're not taking care of yourself. How you know is, you know, test number one, check your underwear drawer. <laughs> Are they just horrid and nasty and you would die if anybody ever saw them? It's time for you to have new underwear. And you can do that for about 11 bucks at Target. And so likewise, you can get um, some furniture, some a little plant, you can wipe the table, you can tidy up in the house. And we talk here a lot about clutter and clutter is a way that we express, you know, chaos inside on the outside. It's not a big psychological game we're playing, it happens. But you can help yourself feel better by tidying up. You can help yourself feel worthy of earning more money by tidying up. So clothes that are permanently stained, like, Maybe keep one outfit in case you're going to paint something, but just don't keep them anymore. I know, right? And there's all the, there's a lot of people with hoarder mentality where they're like, no, you can use the fabric and cut them up and donate them to a mortuary or something. Yes, you could. But if I made that plan, I would go right back into like inaction. So it has to be an easy action. Where I live, you can put almost everything out on the street and somebody takes it and it gets used. So that's always comforting. But occasionally stuff just, it does have to be thrown out deal with it. Okay. <laughs> the energy of under earning leaks into things of your life. And they are, you know, when they're like ucky, dirty, stained, broken, and you don't replace them. Even when you can, you don't, right? Broken appliances, things where you think maybe I'll be able to fix this electric toothbrush one day. Will you though? How about put a timeline on it? Give yourself a year. If I learn how to fix an electric toothbrush within a year, great. And if not, get rid of it. Have yourself a nice toothbrush. These, there's little things that you can have that are quite nice. I, there's some things that I like to have. And when I, in the days when I had like no money, I like to have something I could put in the bathtub, like a bath with something nice in it. It doesn't even have to be that nice, like a $10 thing, right? Some $10 nice bubble bath or something. And then Literally, I would pretend that I was in a hotel, like a nice hotel. And another friend of mine does this thing. If you have different routes you could drive when you drive somewhere to work, let's say, where you go over and over, and one of them is through this terrible, like ugly uh, part of town, and one of them is really nice and there's trees and nice things to see, even though the one that's nice is five minutes longer, take that one because it dictates the world you live in. You perceive yourself as being in a nice world where things are functional and good and there's trees. And next thing you know, it rubs off on the inside. It rubs off on what you can imagine for your life. 
So at a certain point, your belongings dictate what you can earn. There's, there's a relationship there, a two-way relationship. Obviously what you earn dictates what you can, what can belong to you, but there's, it's two way. There's times when you might have to get that nice outfit from the thrift shop. There's nothing wrong with a used outfit if it fits you and it's clean and it's pressed and it helps you look the part. All right, ninth sign of under earning is the misuse of time. And one big form of that is procrastination. Now you might be someone who works like crazy when the boss needs it, but you can't even put in a couple of hours at the end of the job to proofread your own work. You won't do it for you. Or you get online and you learn something that would make your work better. Do you do that? Are you willing? Will you get a book and read it for the thing that you need to know about your industry? Finally, the 10th sign that you're under earning is you're surrounded by people who haven't paid you what they owe. It's weird. Like that stops happening when you feel good about what you charge, when it's enough and you feel like you are doing a worthy job to earn it. It stops happening. So when I first started freelancing, that's the only thing that ever happened. My very first client ever, I did all this work and I kept saying, I think we need an agreement. I think I need a down payment. And they were like, yeah, yeah, soon. Well, this is kind of macabre, but they, they died. They just abruptly died. They had an ulcer or something. And I got this phone call that they died. And I said, okay, well, I never got the down payment. And they were like, too bad. We didn't sign a contract. I didn't have a leg to stand on. So I learned the hard way. <laughs> I learned the hard way and I started getting very businesslike and having contracts and now we use DocuSign and we, we have actual agreements and terms of service and if you buy a course from us there's a term of service that tells you what, what you get and tells you the conditions under which you would get a refund or not and we feel good about that. We've done a lot of thought about like what do we think is fair and everybody has a chance to see it. So maybe if you are not getting paid by people. Maybe it's because you didn't set clear expectations. That's what a contract is. That's what a terms of service is. Um, because you don't like asking for the money. You're uncomfortable asking for the money or you feel like you have to keep working when they haven't paid on time. Like, like somehow they can get away with not paying but you have to people please them by working or they'll get mad. This is where people with CPTSD fall down every time <laughs> at first, but I'm here to tell you like, just don't do that. Don't do that. Have your boundaries, say it in the nicest way. It's like, great, I'll resume work when we get that payment made. Getting paid what you're worth on time in work where you're valued on a path of growth so that you can be materially secure and financially sound, it, it's going to take all the trauma healing you've got. You need good boundaries. You need to learn to calm the triggers that can so easily make you back down when you work with people or work to advance your career. And most of all, you have to overcome the trauma-driven habit of believing everything difficult is controlled by people other than you. When you're healing trauma, this is the big epiphany that so much of your experience is under your control. In healing, we learn to take life on life's terms and do our best within the world around us, which isn't always a fair world, I'll give you that, but we work on ourselves. So there's this excellent 12-step program, by the way, called Under Earners Anonymous. I haven't been, but I have friends who have and they love it and I watch their transformation when they went. It costs nothing and it's a place where you can work with other people and support each other to heal from under earning. So whether, whether you decide to go the 12-step route or come into my membership program, um, you'll need support to face these patterns that have held you back. Building a life that no longer is suppressed by trauma and not suppressed by people who mistreat you is the great adventure that's in front of you right now. And healthy earning is one way you support yourself to do that and to be able to keep doing it. It starts with basic healing of your trauma symptoms. And when that gets better, everything gets better. And the potential in you that you didn't even know you had comes shining through. So if you want to check out my course on healing childhood PTSD, you can click on that right here and I will see you very soon.